Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Chu, and I'm director of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. And I'm delighted to introduce to you tonight our Talking to Our Time series, continuing with tonight's guest, Christoph Wudichko. Um, Christoph is no stranger to the Hirshhorn. Some of you will remember recently we projected his work onto the building of the Hirshhorn as part of our 1980s exhibition. Of course, that was the work that he created in 1988 for the Hirshhorn. It was really one of the first projections onto the building as artwork. He, I remember um, studying his work in the 80s and 90s, and he was really one of those artists who was at the forefront of what we now know as public art. He's going to be accompanied with Stefan Akin, our chief curator. But before I hand it over to them, I'd like to invite you all to a um, wonderful program that we have, our James T. Dimitrian annual lecture this year with Jordan Castile on September 30th. And of course, if you're interested, please do join us for our very first virtual Hirshhorn Ball tomorrow night at 7.30 with the theme of futurism. We thought of no better theme this year for a ball that brings together art and fashion than a theme of futurism. We're all future looking and uh, tomorrow night it will be hosted by Machine Dazzle, but also bring together many artists from around the world with their own artworks and videos, including Raphael Lozano Hammer, Marika Mori and Jacoby Satterwhite. So please do join us if you can. Um, and now it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome Stefan Akin, our chief curator, who will be in conversation with artist Christoph Wudichko. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Welcome, Christoph. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to have you with us. Uh, perhaps before we start um, asking you and grilling you with questions, um, um, I may introduce you, take a few minutes to, uh, to say a few words about your illustrious career. And as Melissa said, your role, uh, your key and crucial role in the development of public art. In the early 80s, uh, you started doing great slide and video projections. Video would come a little bit afterwards onto public uh, buildings. Um, and the essence of these works was to give a voice to the voiceless, or at least to those who in society had no voice in the public sphere. All these marginalized communities, um, uh, whether immigrants uh, or, or others, or um, individuals who had gone through trauma, whether it was personal trauma, accident, war, conflict. Um, and you have been steadfast in this direction since the 80s and always renewing uh, your view on the world, adapting it to the current situation. You have um, realized almost 100 of such projects in every possible continent. Um, you were born in Poland, um, but you moved to Canada. Thank you, bienvenue. Um, uh, we were happy to have you there for many years. Um, and you taught at NASCAD, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, which was a hub of conceptual art, as, as many know, for years. Uh, you are now based in New York. You teach at Harvard um, after having been the director of the interrogative design group at the MIT, also in Boston. Um, and you continue to do extraordinary, challenging and, and meaningful work. Um, some of your projects will um, be taking place in the coming days and weeks in New York and in Basel. So Christoph, uh, welcome. And um, maybe we can start by, uh, by the beginning. Um, we, we have um, some slides uh, with us to, um, to, for you to walk us through your, your, your oeuvre. Um, but I'll, I'll hand the, uh, the mic over to you. So we <clears throat> will start with uh, projects developed in Canada. Uh, it looks like, uh, uh, the kind of work I'm doing and for which I'm uh, known to some degree 
it's all started really in Canada. This is uh, the projection uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, the center of the city. There is a complex building called Scotia Towers. And that's where the first time I actually uh, publicly presented my work. Uh, publicly, because it was actually announced through intercom, through a system of music system, in fact, in shopping mall inside of this building, underneath of this tower. But the projector was placed uh, on the roof and it was simple Kodak carousel projector. Uh, but somehow I managed strategically to project one image in hope that it will animate entire, entire volume of this uh, building. I was not sure whether this is going to be a beginning of, of a major <laughs> journey in my projectionist life. But uh, in the night, there was nobody there, really, except I started to hear some sound. And I realized there was a group of people laughing. They were just laughing loudly. And I realized that there is something in it. If they are laughing, there must be something. Because when people laugh, they don't really know exactly why they laugh. They have to figure out what causes that laughter. It's quite possible they recognize something about themselves in this projection, in terms of their identification with institutions and buildings, the architecturization of the bodies and bodification of architecture, the projection identification, a kind of phenomenological effect when we actually are working inside of the building, looking at them from outside and so forth. So that, then I realized that there is something to follow. So, and this building is uh, Scotia Towers. So Scotia is the 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 bank, um, Scotia Bank, um, that was uh, founded in Nova Scotia, um, I think in the early nineteenth century. Um, and um, you transform the building into um, a, a, a person, uh, which we read as a banker, uh, knowing uh, knowing that it's a it's well, a very disciplined body, ready to collaborate, cooperate. You know, so yeah, sure, one becomes a building and building becomes the person with time. If you're a loyal member of the institution and the institution is identified by the facade and, the, you know, the form of the building. Mm -hmm. Now you had um, uh, moved from Poland just a few years before you had experienced um, um, communism. Um, right. The sure, I understood uh, some aspect of that identification or this kind of power of architecture uh, because of my experience in Poland, of course. But I could not really walk through those issues publicly in Poland. Mm. Here, actually, I could try, you know, before, you know, I don't know, somebody would disrupt my uh, first early attempts that I conducted without permission. Hmm. And you had uh, studied in industrial design at the school of, uh, which was merged within the School of Fine Arts, right? Yes, yes. In Warsaw. Well, in fact, this kind of structuralist point, uh, trying to make an organic supplement or complement or extension of the body of the building, you know, it came with my design upbringing especially considering the overwhelming impact of structuralism or structuralist kind of uh, direction, the media projects that was, uh, you know, quite strong in Poland at that time. Hmm. So that's your first, um, your very first project. Um, and then you do uh, a few others in Canada, but uh, one key moment, um, that's another one at the School of Architecture in Dalhousie. Okay. Um, and then you, you, um, you make it back to Europe um, in Germany, uh, in Stuttgart, um, uh, and you're part of an exhibition of Canadian art, right? Of Canadian yeah. artists. Artists from Canada. Artists. Yeah. Right. Because and I was not Canadian citizen at the time. <laughs> so it was a very convenient title for me yes. to be part, part of the show. But you are now, though. You showed me your passport last time we spoke. Of course. 
I'm proud of it. And uh, the, um, so c can you tell us about these extraordinary projects? You had one um, official project, but then you also had a sort of a squatter or a, a pirate project to, to that in that, during that event. Well, during the time of this exhibition, 1983, it was an uh, election campaign, a very, very dramatic Christian Democratic Party wanted to install itself uh, to power by promising that uh, it will guarantee the peace for Germany by deploying uh, uh, batteries of, uh, of uh, uh, Pershing, Pershing II missiles that can be actually equipped with nuclear warheads around each major city of Germany. It, the slogan was, uh, the peace can only be achieved through strength. Mm -hmm. you know, that, this kind of uh, slogan of Charles was part of, uh, of, it was written, described on the base of the monument at the center of Stuttgart in Schloss Platz. Perhaps mm -hmm. we could see that project. Uh, that's the following one, but, uh, and then yeah. we'll go right. right. So that's, this is called Victory Column. It's from the time, I guess, Napoleonic Wars, when, when Germany was first against them with Napoleon. But in any case, uh, that Pershing to missile became an icon used by the uh, Christian Democratic Party. And it's just ended up in Time magazine cover. So I, I thought that that missile was all somewhere inside of this column as the column was pregnant with this missile. You need to just make an x-rays to actually show uh, that missile uh, that is inside of the victory column because it's an, it's a serious iconic, uh, iconic uh, symbol. Of symbol course. Of icon. Now you're there as a, as a, a part of a, a, a sort, of, sort of an official uh, delegation of artists working in yeah. Canada. You so do the project on the Mercedes-Benz building, a little similar, yeah, right? A little similar Hauptbahnhof, to the one. Hauptbahnhof, big central uh, train station in Stuttgart, where Stuttgart is the center of a production of uh, Daimler Benz, exactly the central factory of Daimler Benz. Uh, right. uh, of Mercedes Benz. So yeah. uh, it's actually where lots of immigrants connect. They, most, they work, there's an enormous amount of people at that time, especially from Turkey, work in Daimler Benz company. It's, and now uh, those, those so hands. Kind of overlooking and managing, managing basically the movement of those people uh, through the station and they mm -hmm. were gathering all the time and also the city and the central Mercedes-Benz plant. And now t tell us, those hands, um, what image are they taken from? Well, uh, they're not my hands, but they could be. <laughs> I guess once you make this gesture, it's definitely, uh, are in a, in hands you see on many photographs of official corporate kind of events or you know, okay. appearances of uh, executives and so forth. Mm -hmm. That word, uh, right, deciding the fates uh, of, um, of the labor force. Um, so when we go back to the, um, the, this one, exactly, the uh, victory column. Uh, it, was, uh, it was done without permission. Actually, it was against advice that I should not do it. So no. it was very short projection it was a time of carnival in fact uh, you know so it was uh, city was busy with enjoying itself it was a good moment to try this kind of work it's the first time i projected image that was not uh, part of human body <laughs> it was it was another kind of body uh, mm. It's a very powerful um, equation between an image and a, and a building. And uh, a part of your, you know, those, those great projects that you have or, or defining element is to uh, reveal or unveil the hidden forces that are at play behind the symbols and, and the public building. Yeah. It's actually like a time bomb. Those uh, war memorials, because it is a war memorial, no doubt, 
there is an angel that is giving a law award to do to the victor at the top a standard kind of item so the war memorials actually are not only commemorating they also perpetuating a certain concept of war an obligation to die to to to, to give your life yeah, you know, on the altar of some kind of uh, power, authority, and also uh, ideas. So this is, you know, they are kind of ideological war machines, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why some uh, uh, installing all those Pershing missiles around each city is like basically installing more columns <laughs> of war memorials. Yeah. They're actually perpetuated wars. They don't mm -hmm. do anything to stop the war. They are ready to be employed, deployed for the mobilization process to draw to 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 drive people mm -hmm. into the war. You you actually were born in in forty three. Um, uh, you were um, taken away from Warsaw in your very early. Um, uh, years and came back to a, a city that had been devastated by war. Those are certainly um, memories that have um, that you keep as a very young child. Right during the Second World War, in the Warsaw alone, eight hundred thousand people were killed. Warsaw residents. So it's a miracle actually that uh, I'm alive since I was born in 1943 during the war. Yeah, so, of course, I don't think it's a, it's a good idea to uh, uncritically worship those uh, monuments. The, mm -hmm. It's actually a suicide mission. Cities are populated by those war memorials that, that, uh, that advocate, perpetuate, and encourage people to actually heroically die. At the same time, cities are targets of massive bombardment and destruction. That's why there are so many cities that are so populated, there are more than uh, 10 or 15 million, some of them. So, of course, they will be major target of war. Mm. Yet, mm. nobody is really speaking back to those monuments mm. uh, critically enough. Well, that was certainly um, a, a strong moment of talking back to, um, to such a monument. Um, should we, um, I think after that, uh, we, Right, well, this, this brings us to, um, to a, a, an extraordinary project that, um, that uh, as Melissa uh, explained, you installed on the Hirshhorn uh, itself in 1988. You'll tell us more about the context and then we restaged it with your help and of course your, your guidance in 2018, if my memory is yeah, correct. The context was uh, very special. It was the final weeks of uh, uh, electoral campaign of uh, George Bush, the older George Bush. Mm -hmm. So he actually, uh, his uh, agenda was, uh, or his vision of uh, the nation, was actually a nation of uh, what he called thousands of points of light, meaning people of good intentions uh, who are rich enough to actually provide uh, a support for various uh, programs and resolve various matters when, without relying on the government. It's kind of uh, self-reliance, but a more conservative notion of it. So that thousands of points of light, definitely. Yes, so I thought maybe one of those thousands of points of light I should project uh, on the facade uh, of, of the building, which is located the very central part of the National Mall, and not far from White House, in front of National Archives. And of course, uh, with Congress, you know, uh, not far. So, that's the candle. And then the, 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 the revolver has something to do with uh, another aspect of uh, this uh, uh, vision of, of the president to come, to, uh, to be installed. A strong, very strong, aggressive approach. And it's a, a contradictory situation, of course, because on one hand, he was, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, against uh, abortion. On the other hand, he was for, for death sentence. He was pro-life and he was against life. Um, but anyway, he was definitely very busy speaking about this. So those microphones are some located somewhere underneath of the mouth of his mouth. So I'm kind of made uh, use of this facade uh, because of its uh, anatomy. It had nothing to do with the museum. <laughs> it has something to do with this kind of buildings that were built at that time. For sure, but you could not have made a better use of this building, which sits um, right in the middle of the, I mean, face right. the middle of the mall, at the distance between the Capitol oh. and the George Washington Monument. And that yeah. is in itself totally closed in on itself. Yeah, it's and a, then you open it up and make it speak to the mall. Right, it's a very generous uh, act or support of the museum to allow me to actually do that. Uh, considering its location, I think it's perfect. It was perfect timing. Well, I, I cannot explain those images truly because we don't have a good theory for metaphor. And in fact, I can do, just confess, I had hundreds of different ideas what to do with this facade, many, many different images. And I rejected all of them, and those three images was, were left. So I could not do anything else but project this, even if I was not 100% sure that they are right images. That's my intuition that dream was, was driving me into this. And I couldn't do anything else. Hmm. And it still stands today as such a powerful uh, metaphor of an open metaphor, I would want to say, something that speaks still very openly to our time. Right, we could also could read it many different ways. Uh, with time, there are other ways you could read it. The one thing is just the culture of revenge. Well, the un inability to actually complete mourning of somebody lost. Be you rather than awaiting and, and completing the process of mourning, accepting the loss to move on in your life, people too quickly are, uh, you know, uh, reaching for the revolver, you know, to really find some enemy or somebody whom they can blame for the loss. So that's another issue here. Uh, the, one other way to read it. And that's, that's, uh, that's very tragic, actually. Yes, and... Um... Uh, in 2018, when we uh, restaged it, as we um, projected it, um, the Parkland um, uh, shooting occurred. And um, this work resonated in very different ways. Uh, to the context in America has changed. In 30 years, um, the issue was not so much the pro-life uh, and... Um, and uh, pro-death uh, agenda of the Bush candidacy, but um, a string of, of mass shootings and a, and a general concern over public violence that had uh, taken hold of the country. Um, you also uh, upgraded the technology, if I can bring you on the <laughs> more statistical <laughs> yeah, side of... Yeah, technology is something that people very often bring in to this to discussion about this kind of work because and some people even say that I am one of the, the pioneers of what is being called projection mapping. Of course I couldn't even, I didn't know about that name didn't exist, there was no such thing at that time. But uh, now those projectors are so complex, it's almost impossible to find the old ones so we have to extrapolate here this, this um, uh, process of preparing a project, putting projectors in different places and using video projectors rather than slide projectors and uh, actually um, re reconstructing this projection uh, step by step, which wasn't that easy, in fact. Mm -hmm. Um, that same year that you do the Hirshhorn projection, an absolute extraordinary projection, you, um, you, um, you start working on the homeless vehicles. Um, 
in while in New York. And this is a drawing of the of one of the homeless vehicles and um, and a larger view uh, um, of um, of well, this drawing, drawing is is showing uh, its complex uh, functional program. So it's good that we are seeing this because it, it was designed to, uh, to meet all known to me functions uh, that uh, needs are to respond to the needs of homeless people, even if those needs should not exist in civilized world. So to actually, uh, it's a scandalous, there are scandalous needs. There's a scandal that they actually exist, those needs. So the function of this vehicle was to expose the scandal while in fact responding to those needs as an emergency uh, matter. Mm. Not to propose a solution, absolutely not. Actually to make it, uh, the, that project, it's an impossible as a solution. Imagine 100,000 homeless vehicle like this taking over the city because there was that amount of homeless people at that time in New York City. It's actually a very similar amount of homeless people today, I think. It's yeah. just we are not talking about this as much as, as at the time, because official count was 75,000 by, by the city hall. But in, in, I, in, in I, the in reality was 100,000 because, because they, were, they didn't count people living between the buildings or in abandoned buildings and so forth. Right. Let, let's look at a, another image of um, this project that... Um... So it's, it's about sleeping, uh, it's about cooking, it's about uh, collecting cans from metal, glass and plastic uh, and... for resale, you know, and, and uh, you know, many other functions, washing yourself and as it to could be a toilet, once you extend it, you know, it is, it's just the vehicle almost collapsed under the weight of its functional program because it was carrying on all those things in order to articulate those needs. In fact, turn the operator into legitimate a member of uh, urban uh, population who works day and night and actually contributes to recycling. and should be paid for it, in fact, not uh, more than just simply reselling those bottles and cans. So operating a specially designed equipment make, you know, it really creates uh, the problem, you know, the image mm. of that person much different than the one that, that was kind of notoriously, you know, uh, reproduced everywhere. The kind of faceless, uh, you know, uh, scavenger. No, um, and then this is a work that indeed like lays out how uh, organized to a certain extent um, the life of the homeless had become due to the, the stark numbers. This image of course um, um, shows a stark contrast between an 80s uh, decade of uh, immense and hyper wealth and, um, and the yeah, homelessness. Maybe was a time, can... a time of Ronald Reagan. So the context was to actually privatize everything and to sell. I mean, Margaret Thatcher being a friend of Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan had much more things to sell, you know, uh, to private uh, developers and uh, corporations, whatever was public. Mm -hmm. But still, there were lots of things that had been destroyed at times, such as single room occupancy hotels. It was a really a last resort for homeless people to be able to to spend the coldest part of the year, you know, in some really reasonable way. Hmm. Um, One thing that, um, and uh, I don't want to uh, bring you uh, away from these, these considerations that have s still such a relevance today, but um, uh, one key element of your work here is how you worked at, with, with homeless people to design it. You had to go into the field, so to say, yes. um, to uh, to understand the, right. the functionalities, oh, the needs. Yes. Maybe we I, can. I that. went there. I presented my ideas, and they were laughing at me. <laughs> so they they told me, "You are crazy. You 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 know you think that we just need some small shell, you know, to crawl and and hide." No, we want to be visible because it's danger if there's garbage trucks uh, drives back on the rear gear 
in the middle of night at five o'clock in the morning in the winter it will crush us you know if we are high we have to be visible sometimes it's about privacy it's about security it's about safety so more of, more of those comments actually transform my early naive drawings into something like what do you see in this picture we have a little clip that we can show um we have some time it's a three minute clip there we go The recital right here. Yes. Okay. So it will open this way. It will swing out. Yes. You have the basket in the front. Right. See, this doesn't have to be a complicated matter. Well, that's why I want to. You understand it, what yeah. I'm saying? Because it can be. It can be cheaply made, the simplest and fastest way to unload your cart, get your money. Well, get it, get everything processed, get your money, get out. Because as soon as you turn that first corner you come to, there's another can there. Right. See, you can actually work in one circle. I work a circle. I can circle this park three times. Uh -huh. Right. And come up with shit every time I come up. Uh, excuse and, me. And where, where, and where, do you, um, where do you take the cans once you've filled up your car? What's the nearest place from here, for instance? Oh, wow. You got I mean, a long, a long way. way right? you got a long that, way. That's what you're saying. That's uh, why you've got to do the 500 cans. Right. Because then it's worth it. Like this here. Yeah, it's but, for you, but for your safety, for you to sleep. You think it's, it's better if you are visible? Yeah. Uh, that you are there rather than hidden? You are there because what about if somebody comes and turns you over? You get mad or something. At least you can see somebody's in there. Oh. See? You gotta look at that too, because there's a lot of you know crazy motherfuckers around in the street too. Oh, you good. Know, How about at night? Uh, a see, light, uh, an emergency light. Sure. To show that you are there because of garbage trucks. Huh? Yeah, I because they so. might take you and just put you in. Right. You got to have a base. Springs on the bottom. Fold up. These cans out of this cart right here, I can fold it up. And I can stick it up and it'll be like this and it'll be flat. If you want a demonstration, I'll even give it to you. Wow, I still didn't get this because what first you suggested was a long All right, I'm cart. talking about a long a cart. Yes. All right, the barriers right. and all. All right. But your base has to be able to hold up. Without changing the length of the... Without changing the yeah, right. right. So then I will have so additional words, space... Have, have have additional space in front. Right. Yeah. Exactly. For a bottle. Right, whatever. I'm learning yeah. now. <laughs> Not even. Yeah. You don't even have to have bottles. But you so you will still have so the space... So the person, that person that's picking up... For a the person, picking back in other areas. The person that's back. picking up cans, bottles, or whatever. Also has a tendency of picking up clothes, books. But you pick the people read magazines, people read these magazines. Try not. But somebody else might not have read that magazine. Exactly. And you could turn around pop it from it. You gotta think about the weather too. Oh, right. They're all dripping wet. And you put them into a box, the box can fall apart. You can lose everything right there. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? So you gotta consider that as well. Hmm. Um, and this is the homeless vehicle that we acquired at the Hirshhorn uh, a few years ago. Uh, so, so, so finally, it, it it has found its home. It's when, in the museum. It's is, it's you know. um, a work that we value immensely uh, as you know and um, it's currently on display in the exhibition manifesto art and agency i think if one artist really has uh, consistently all throughout his career uh, brought the two together it's certainly you christophe um i'd like to um, move on i mean a key element here is is how you have listened um, to those marginalized communities 
and giving them a voice. And the projects that we'll be showing, I'm wearing a little bit of time, we have 10 minutes before the Q&A, um, that follow, you, um, you are projects where these people have a voice. So can you tell us about Alien Staff? Well, this, uh, this is uh, called Alien Staff. It's actually a walking stick which speaks with the pre-recorded voice of, uh, of its owner and also has containers of precious relics that relate to that person's displacement. So that's a, it's a very good uh, triggering uh, situation to engage people, to actually create curiosity for, uh, for uh, those uh, who are not uh, maybe talking about actually immigrants and refugees who are operating and performing those uh, walk, walking sticks, speaking sticks. So they are uh, kind of uh, holding a symbolic icon, something to do with displacement, walking sticks always, something to do with displacement, all some sort of stuff. So anyway, without such equipment and a speaking stick, no one will really come easily closer, ask questions, and engage conversation with those immigrants, strangers, uh, uh, in so many different cities that were using those, uh, uh, those, those equipment you know, in all over the world. So I met me for, for a while. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes they're like uh, precious relics that, that needs to explain. Somebody asks, what is it? Why is this thing there? So the person who is carrying the stick can say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to speak about it. I just need to have it. Or might say, well, that's just family service, you know, the little uh, coffee, coffee set, you know, this goes broken when I move from one place to another, uh, from Italy, now I'm here in, in France, and I feel a little bit like this broken set myself, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and also what's pre-recorded, there are stories of displacement, the stories that it's always hard to say, it takes, might take a year or maybe several months to find the words and to record finally something that must be said, but not if, whether someone wants to hear it or not, you know. So that's, that's what those uh, things are. Anyone could, uh, you know, there could be actually a response to the question that is very painful for strangers, immigrants. One of them is, uh, the two of you, where are you from? So they answer, why do you, how do you know I, I'm, we are from the same place? You know, <laughs> you know there's uh, thousands of miles between us, the place we were born. I speak eight languages. I don't know, my colleagues speak six languages, and we only share two. So, oh, or another question is, uh, oh, where are you from? You know, oh, that's a very generous question you're asking me. Nice. You know, but in fact, I feel like being deported by being asked this way. You know, why don't you ask me what I'm doing? You mm. know, rather than where I'm from. Why do you kind of work in a work of geography in your mind? You know, you know, this is a, it's a colonizing thing. Of course, it's a very generous question, but please, please, why don't you ask me which, where are you from? You know, I'm from many places, you know, mm. so, uh, and by that way, you know, there are other things we should discuss, so, or so forth. So, questioning the question, uh, and all this can be pre-recorded, you know, people can really gain certain level of consciousness trying to find the words for unspeakable experiences, and that's important project in development of my work, because mm -hmm. I learned from those uh, uh, instruments how to animate buildings and facades with video and sound, asking people to speak through those monumental structures, symbolic structures. You know, basically, uh, you could speak through the special uh, prosthetic equipment like this, which I call, I call it cultural pros prosthetics, or we can speak through the facade and symbolic structure or sculptural monument. Mm -hmm. yeah, I do both, but I did learn how to work with people through this project. Let's, let's uh, move to another project that is a consequence of this. Exactly, uh, so 
there are many, I design many projects actually with immigrants and strangers and, and uh, those who feel strange and alienated to uh, create conditions for them to open up and speak with unsolicited speech in public space. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, it's, it's a friend, uh, mutation of the project, which uh, is showing uh, eyes of the person speaking and also uh, with, uh, with the speakers, the person speaks from the sky as he or she was an angel. Mm. Angel actually about to land or maybe uh, uh, disappear, disappear, but also uh, uh, cre creating kind of situation in which we are on the ground must look up to those people. And these are, at them. these are immigrants also? Or? They are refugees, refugees. Uh, uh, from Africa mostly in Italy because this took place uh, a year ago, more than a year ago in Milan, in Italy, oh, yeah. with help of the organization called More Art, which has, is working here in New York, but sometimes also in Italy. I know that we have still a few projects to uh, uh, run through, um, one being a um, monument in um, New York City in, at Madison yeah. Square Park. Um, yeah. Maybe we can... Um, Talk right, this, about this, and show the, the, this is a, a very beautiful park in the middle of Manhattan. It's actually uh, perfectly kept, and it's a terrain, it's a site of enormous amount of projects run by public art uh, you know, uh, program. Uh, it's Madison Square Park Conservancy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is uh, one of the monuments, and it's actually a war memorial because it's a it's a monument to a first American admiral who who won some battles against uh, forces of the South during the uh, Civil War. So yeah. it's 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 actually speaking uh, the heroism and glory of uh, you know of uh, of a great soldier. And uh, so you... I decided to, to actually lend this monument uh, to those who know more about war, who are real uh, war heroes. They are refugees. They are fleeing civil wars. And this is a monument to civil war hero. But, the, you know, the, it's not the generals that are heroes of civil war, they're refugees. There, there is, uh, uh, you know, more than... Uh, there's just this enormous amount of people here uh, right now displayed. Just to say that uh, there is uh, uh, there's such a great number of refugees today. They are um, all fleeing the war and they don't necessarily have a chance to say what it means for them to uh, flee and also how many, what is the process, uh, how much time they spend in refugee camps. Could be 20 years, could be seven years, could be more. And They're leaving their children behind. So this is what they say through this, uh, through this uh, 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 monument. Can we look at an excerpt, uh, maybe a one minute excerpt? And, and after that, I'm sure that we'll want to talk about uh, we want to hear your view on um, um, the considerations that have been shared in recent times over the uh, right. public monuments in right. cities, mostly war memorials. Yes, there's so much romanticization of those war memorials. So there's a contradiction between those people say and what we think of civil war. You know? If the civil war was happened today in the United States, let's not even think about it. <laughs> but it, considering different population in 19th century, today it would be two million refugees of the civil war, because civil war, American civil war, was a major refugee crisis of 19th century. Hmm. Let's hear a bit. The Kutaya refugee camp in, in 2001. 
to stay in Putaya camp. It was hard for me, leaving my child. If anyone could imagine leaving their child behind, I don't think anyone would imagine leaving their, their child behind for an evening or day or two. I have to leave my child behind me for 10 years. 10 years. So these are before I came here. Some people kept telling me that you're not going to be happy in America. People will not accept you. People don't like you because you you're not American. Um, I just wanted to say there are more than seventy-one million refugees today. 71 million refugees, yes. Yes, yes. Yep. That's... Um, that's well, only if not true. many people have a, they all might not have a chance to say something directly about their experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if there are only a few who can speak in some prominent place for such a long time, it was uh, several months long projection, that mm -hmm. uh, during the time of actual epidemics, was not, not much really open to see in terms of contemporary art that was there all the time. So I have to congratulate Madison Square Park. Yes, of course. They, they do a great, really yeah. a great program. Yes, they absolutely wonderful projects, uh, meaningful. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next. I know that we have little time. Um, um, this is um, an indoor installation that you did with the uh, Lincoln Monument. In a, in a mirror um, uh, relationship with itself and again animated. Can we have a, a clip of that? So that's not so much about yeah. immigration than about the, the State of the Union. And that's important because it's a it's a actually gallery installation of a projection. Gallery alone in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, of course, monuments presented inside of museums and galleries. So it's not completely unfamiliar. Place. But it's possible to create more of a dialogue between monuments and more complex projects when you work inside you know, of, uh, of um, space. So you can really work through many possibilities. This is actually a, a, a project through those, through the replica of uh, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Monument, there are uh, two groups of residents of New York City speaking. One from uh, Staten Island, which is, um, you know, I mean, the, or Staten Island is divided into two sections. One that is mostly voting for Democrats and another that is mostly voting for Republicans. So this actually creates possibility to, uh, to, to record both representatives of both parts of Staten Island and actually start to listen to each other, not only speak to each other. Of course, disagreeing, but in more, uh, let's say, patient way. So the process of recording was such that people were recording uh, one, uh, representatives on one side and then ask the other side to respond, and then sometimes back and forth, and on occasions even speaking at the same time in the studio. They were much more uh, thoughtful. Still, differences are clear. That's the name of the show is A House Divided with three dots at the end. It's the beginning of famous speech of Abraham Lincoln. Should we look at a clip? We have little time. Actually, we've already exceeded our time, um, uh, Christoph, if we want to um, make time for uh, questions and answers. Should we look at a little clip and then maybe a minute? We're having discussions as as usually around the table 
when we weren't talking about football coming to a uh, the the political um, I guess the the differing views of of America that had come around since my parents' generations, you know, down into my my older brothers and sisters' generations, and then into my my sons' uh, generations, and. Um, we were talking, and, and it was funny. It was because it was like we weren't even on the same planet. The discussion, if you remember, became mean-spirited almost. And I brought up the Statue of Liberty, and I said, well, what about the words underneath the Statue of Liberty, which s specifically says, send us your poor, your tired, your hungry, your... I mean, these are not... We're not asking for PhDs coming in. That's not what we're about. That's not what this country was about. You made it that way. Maybe we could, um, it's a powerful work that, that I had the pleasure to see. Um, just, just a plug, as we say, you will be restaging um, again in Basel uh, next week. A great project also about immigration um, projection where immigrants in Switzerland uh, speak of their experience of being immigrants in Switzerland. Uh, Illegal immigrants, sans papier. Mm, sans yeah. papier, yeah. Um, so that starts next week. At, uh, maybe we can see another image of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of what it looks like on the Kunstmuseum Basel um, and with voices, of course, and, and testimonies and uh, and, and stories. Um, Christoph, we should open it up to um, uh, the audience. I see that we have a number of questions. Um, I should, um, well, let's, let's, let's pick up on this one by Glenn Wise. There are a number of questions we'll, we'll, we'll try to uh, um, uh, speak the most. Glenn Weiss, what do you think should happen with the Confederate monuments throughout the United States, which is, of course, a big conversation, topic of conversation right now. Well, now we could have an entire session or many meetings. So, <laughs> and actually, maybe we should not conclude what should be done with monuments. The issue is how shall we commemorate? Um, how should we actually uh, uh, see the past and discuss it so it will not happen again? But in any case, um, those sites of monuments, some of them actually uh, can be just sites of removed monuments. Uh, some of them are monuments that are covered with graffitis, with all kinds of uh, uh, statements. And, and some of them are constant, constantly being uh, subjected to various debates and discussions. I think this is extremely powerful and important. So uh, with my uh, colleague, Kirk Savage, uh, who is a historian of Civil War memorials, we had lots of conversations about this. And uh, well, first reaction is, please do not clean up graffitis. Do not uh, remove, uh, you know, in the, the memory of all, of all of them, the movement, movement that actually questioned in such powerful way uh, those very monuments. And the, cre the question is, that, oh, how to create conditions for continuation of discourse and actually, uh, of facing the history in a more and more of a complex way. So I'm not saying really what should be done with monuments. I'm just responding to what's happening. And I think it's a fantastic, greatest moment you know, of history that we can, we can say so many things to our culture that carries on systemic racism in so many different forms. So that we need somehow those monuments uh, but i'm not saying they should all be removed or they should st st all stay it's not me to say 
But it's a very fruitful uh, conversation that is happening right now about, as you said, you know, how do we consider monuments in the future? What you've been doing with public monuments is one way of addressing how the past has commemorated um, uh, itself um, and uh, opening ways to, um, uh, to consider. Yeah, the I, I think that what is needed, and I'm not the only person who is voicing it. I thought I was <clears throat> thinking about it. I, and as an original idea, I realized lots of people are calling for truth and reconciliation commissions and process to be implemented in the United States mm -hmm. to really start telling the truth and um, reveal the whole complexity of our life uh, and our experience with racism. Maybe monuments should be part of this truth and reconciliation. Someone could speak on behalf of them, not to justify what people done who are depicted in those monuments, but to really bring more, more information, more knowledge. So it will not happen again. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, another, um, I was thinking that just two weeks ago, uh, the monument of one of the fathers of the confederation in canada johnny mcdonald was uh, brought down in um, in montreal and uh, as much uh, as he's important in in building the confederation in 1867 he's the one who established the residential schools that the uh -huh. Truth and reconciliation commission in canada um, uh -huh. um talks about and and um, and reveals so there there was a direct effect uh, in this case um, the um, if you were there's a question from Sandra Fossum that's a tricky question uh, Christophe but it, it connects uh, to this if you were given another an opportunity to design a facade for the Hirshhorn today not restage um, oh, no. <coughs> cannot answer to this. It sometimes takes uh, several months or a year to come up with a sketch, you know, <laughs> what to do. Um, but the idea is to actually keep uh, projecting or reinscribing re re things in the same structure in changing circumstances. I think this is uh, not a bad idea. In fact, uh, architecture, as one of the founders of semiology or semiotics, Umberto Eco said, is just interplay between stable symbolic forms and changing circumstances that project themselves on them. So in that sense, maybe uh, it's a very good idea here to create a program of a facade responding to the events on a continuing basis I'm not against permanent projects, although I've done very few of those. Uh, I'm not against them, as long as they change. <laughs> then they're not permanent. <laughs> yes. We got that irony there. Um, and, and one last question from uh, uh, Miriam Juliana. So what sorts of things give you hope? Ah. Uh. When I, when I really work with people, because I do work with people, not only for them, developing to some degree the part of development of the project. And that's what brings me hope, how much they can uh, tell us, how much, the, what's the greatest potential in those people to really uh, see in a prophetic way what's wrong in the country to which they arrive and what was wrong in the country from which they came and what should be changed for their children and for all of us because obviously the the way they are mistreated you know, there is a, a, a you can measure the level of uh, of uh, what's wrong by the way one is mistreated you know uh, by people and country and the system of social society in which you want to arrive. So that kind of prophetic voice of those people and the possibility, of course, when uh, 
it uh, brings me hope. I mean, they actually are prophetic in the sense that they denounce and announce better world. So we're hitting about more than 71 million people. I mean, there is hope. You see what happened in Germany. In Germany, almost more million people was accepted. And uh, they are doing very well. You know, it's incredible. Uh, you know, actually, the society is embracing uh, them more than we think. There are, of course, forces against them. But they do are installing them themselves and become Germans. The new German is being born, you know, because of them. So that's what brings my hope. That's, I'm speaking because I've been working with so many displaced people, strangers, strange, and those who are, who are treated as strangers or who are estranged in some other ways, uh, alienated people, how much they can offer. But artists definitely have things to do to help them, but they will do nothing. I will be do nothing if I didn't work with social workers all of those organizations that are helping displaced people, all, you know, in so many different countries. Uh, so there is a hope also, and you see how much is being done, uh, how much effort is mobilized to help against a sad, often situation that mm -hmm. is generated sometimes by uh, the very governments. Um, that's supposed to uh, protect people from uh, misfortune. Mm. I think we can um, end on this uh, thought, uh, Christoph. Uh, it's been a pleasure, more than a pleasure to have you, to hear you. Thank you so much for a generous chunk of time. Uh, um, also, some, I think everybody, people whom I don't see on the screen, who also um, offer their time, the most precious thing in human life, <laughs> mm -hmm. to be with us and also uh, support somehow the, the, the dialogue. Uh, and I'm sure maybe continuing it behind the scene. Mm. Yeah, I join. Thanks to you guys, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you.